Good morning and good afternoon. My name is John Herbst and I run the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. We have a wonderful event for you for today, for this morning, good afternoon, and this morning or afternoon, depending upon where you are. We are co we're doing it with SEPA, uh, and we have a truly uh, creative experience for you. Uh, it's called Overcoming Polarization in Ukraine, and it's a project that has been put together by Anne Applebaum, who's a director at the ARENA at the London School of Economics and Political Science in London, but also a world-renowned author. Peter Pomerantsev, also a director at the ARENA, London School of Economics and Political Science, and a truly creative thinker on issues like Russian disinformation. We have Natalia Gumenyuk, the co-founder of Public Interest and Journalism Lab in Ukraine, and a wonderful civil activist there. And Yekhan Filbovitsky, who also is a civil activist in Ukraine, and the founder and owner of ProMuva. And I'd like to turn this over to Peter, who'll talk about their project. Ambassador Herbst, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, all of you, for joining. Um, I think it's worth sort of saying a couple of words about what ARENA does. We're a research initiative that has been based at the London School of Economics. We're actually in the process of moving to the uh, Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins. We're going to be ARENA at Agora, uh, which is going to be a, a classicist joy. So we, we kind of, we created this research initiative in order to look um, at the problem of, you know, the, the disinformation and polarization, which are two problems that we believe to be deeply related, um, and to try to find ways to uh, imagine, find evidence for how you might think of a kind of a democratic public sphere of the future. Um, and we do all sorts of projects. We think about what regulations need to change to make our internet uh, a place where we have better civic discourse. Uh, we analyze disinformation campaigns and we work with media uh, in different countries to think about how you can uh, create journalistic content that overcomes disinformation and polarization. We've done projects in Italy with Corriere della Sera on the topic of migration, which is a very um, controversial topic there. Um, we're just finishing some research in Hungary thinking about how could independent media not play into the cultural paradigm that has become dominant there. Um, we're doing some work currently in Ukraine, thinking about why are some people there open to disinformation about the reforms process and how you might engage them. And of course, we've just finished this uh, project about uh, history and, uh, and Ukrainian media. Um, Basically, the way we do our projects, we mix uh, sociology and journalistic um, creativity. Uh, we first do um, a bunch of polling and segmentation that tries to understand whether underneath polarizing issues like migration, for example, uh, or in this case, controversial historical topics, do people have actually something in common? Is there something else that they might want to talk about which isn't being covered in the media or that could be the kind of the way to get them into a more problem solving uh, and less prejudiced uh, mind frame. Um, in Ukraine, as we know, Russian propaganda pushes issues to do with the Second World War, with Banderites, uh, with um, uh, the national um, sort of uh, various uh, national uh, partisan and liberation movements. Uh, and that's like a fixation of Kremlin propaganda. Um, a lot of Ukrainian media does a very good job, I think, a very brave job of trying to fact check and trying to push back against the Russian disinformation, which is incredibly important. But there is always the problem when you're trying to push back against somebody else's uh, propaganda that you end up falling into the agendas that they want to focus on and the frames that they want to focus on. So we want to see, what, are there other things that we could think about or are there ways of thinking about these topics which are not quite so polarizing. And we decided to focus uh, on two social groups once we've done our social analysis. These are two social groups who are very divided by attitudes towards Bandera, attitudes towards more recently decommunization, attitudes even more recently towards, for example, the Orange Revolution, but actually have a huge amount in common when it comes to their social attitudes, their aspirations for Ukraine's future, and so on. And we, you know, one of these groups are sort of educated people from um, sort of 18 to 50 who are uh, you know, largely living in towns like Kiev and Lviv, who are, um, you know, very, very uh, pro Western orientated, voted for Poroshenko, um, and stand on the sort of um, the very patriotic side of, of these historical 
issues. And the other group are also well educated, um, also sort of between 18 and 50, but more to be found in cities in the east, uh, in Kharkiv, in Odessa, who um, stand on different sides, are much more skeptical towards Ban the, the figure of Bandera, much more skeptical towards decommunization, much more skeptical towards the Orange Revolution. And once we kind of analyzed these two groups and done a lot of focus groups with them, really trying to listen to them, we realized that even though they are polarized by these issues, they have a common pool of historical traumas, experiences, which are not particularly articulated in the public sphere. Things to do with late Soviet, uh, you know, late Soviet uh, disasters and abuses of human rights, the war in Afghanistan, uh, Chernobyl, and also common experiences around the 1990s. And these were issues that almost hadn't been brought into public speech. So we started thinking, well, would it be interesting to do things around, around those issues? We worked with Kromatska, with Natalia as chief editor, making around 16 films, short films for Facebook that tested uh, how audiences thought about uh, some of these issues. And I'll just give you the top line results. There's a 90 page report for those who want to really get into the nitty gritty, but just some top line things. Um, you, the two groups that we're talking about, and we think they're very important social groups for Ukraine's future, they are, you know, they have, they are deeply united in their feelings about um, these recent traumatic events, about the 1990s, about Chernobyl, about Afghanistan. Um, there's a common pool of stories that can be told, that need to be told, which uh, bring them together and get them to engage in a common conversation. Um, what was very interesting is that even people who are nostalgic for the Soviet Union, if you ask them concrete questions, do you want the kind of censorship that we saw during Chernobyl in the Ukraine of the future? Do you want the kind of abuses of soldiers' rights that we had in Afghanistan in the Ukraine of the future? They said, no, no, of course we don't. So I think that was one of the other big kind of, um, you know, uh, thinking points at the end of our project that how can you use this, these historical experiences that Ukrainians have gone through to think about the Ukraine of the future? There is a lot of consensus among these different groups about how they see the Ukraine of the future. And they all actually agree that it's one based on human rights uh, and, and quite a lot of respect for um, minorities and, and uh, overall quite a very democratic worldview of Ukraine, also very much integrated into the international community. Um, that's just sort of a couple of sort of uh, of the of the kind of results that we that we came across in our in our research. As I say there's much more in the in the paper itself. Um, but it's very important to understand what it is that we're putting forward. Um, our aim in all our work, whether it's in Ukraine and Italy and Hungary, and I hope in the US is for media that have a kind of a civic mission, uh, a public mission to start thinking much, much more about their responsibility to engage audiences that are currently alienated, that stand on different sides of polarized divides. I mean, I dream of the moment when a, uh, a CNN producer gets up in the morning and starts thinking, how do I engage Fox News viewers? Instead of defining our identity in opposition to them, how do I think about this different challenge of engaging them? I think that's a, a critical need in today's society as we see polarization growing across the world in very, very uh, different uh, regimes and democracies and authoritarian states. So really what we're putting forward is a philosophy, a methodology that is constantly evolving. Um, and, and that's the real, you know, that's the real aim of what we're, uh, of what we're trying to achieve. Um, that was a slightly breathless account. I try to cover two years worth of research and the whole kind of philosophy of what we do in 10 minutes. I'm now gonna breathe out. Um, and I think some of my colleagues at Arena will, will have much more to add. Peter, thank you very much. Um, Anna, you might want to comment on this. Yes, why don't I speak next? Um, just also to, just to frame a little bit what Peter was saying. Um, the point of this project is to find ways of um, of getting people to have better conversations and to converse and um, uh, you know you know to, and to find out what are the difficult subjects that they can talk about in a way that's useful and productive and not divisive. 
And, you know, if, it, if, as it turns out, whenever we talk about World War II, which in Ukraine is that very heavily polarized subject, everybody splits up into angry warring camps, let's find something else that we can talk about. So let's talk, for example, about the war in Afghanistan, which lots of people, you know, in modern Ukraine remember, some of them fought in it. Um, they all have mixed feelings about it. They haven't talked about it in a long time. Um, let's find ways of speaking about that. Um, and, 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 to, and to emphasize one of the really important aspects of this project was that we, we not only identified these, these, these kinds of themes and issues, we also showed people films about them. And I hope that Natalia will, will describe the films um, and discovered that when, when people are looking at films that are about those kinds of issues, um, you know, things that, are, that, are, that don't touch these kind of very polarizing, um, you know, divisive subjects in, in Ukrainian history, when we show them films about other things, then they, not only do they have better conversations afterwards, they also have a higher level of trust. In other words, if you want people to trust what you're showing them and you want them to be interested in it and to, and to, uh, and, and to follow it and not to immediately be pro or against it, then it helps to figure out what are the best um, subjects to be, to be involved in. Um, and what, and it's also important, I think, um, for people to step back and ask, what is this for? Um, and the answer is that it's for anybody who does any kind of creative work in Ukraine. It's for people who make television documentaries. It's for journalists. It's for people who do public communications. Um, it's for anybody who's interested in this question of how to bring Ukrainians together, um, how to, how to, how to have people, um, you know, talking about the same things, how to recreate some kind of public sphere in a country that's been very badly divided by Russian propaganda, um, and how to, how to create, not in a false way, so not in a, you know, we're going to dictate to you what it is, but recreate in an organic way a sense of national narrative. You know, here's the story that we're all part of. These are the subjects that we can all talk about together. Um, and we've already just maybe Natalia will, will talk about this a little bit. We've already spoken a little bit to people in, in Ukrainian television at the culture ministry who do find this kind of this this kind of work really useful because of course they're all thinking along the same lines. What can we do? How can we produce material that's not only good and entertaining and, and engrossing? Um, but is also producing useful, unifying conversations among Ukrainians and not divisive ones. Um, and finally, the, the only thing I would say is, you know, this, we developed this technique over a series of projects and probably it's been, you know, we've used it to its greatest effect in Ukraine, but it is something that could be done anywhere. So while we're talking about Ukraine and the issues that, um, that can bring Ukrainians together, do think about the US or about the UK or about Poland or about other countries that are also deeply divided because it's some of the same ideas and some of the same way of thinking I think could also apply in other countries. And thank you very much, Natalia. Oh yeah, um, so pr probably first uh, for me to stress on how um, un unusual but also how uh, enriching is this experience of, of working when journalists, editors work together with a sociologist and the historians and the professionals. So I do think that's also something very, very interesting that sometimes we have the historians, journalists and sociologists, and they do not uh, help each other in this, in this regard, we can uh, benefit all. But indeed we've done it 16 uh, videos, they were quite short, but very nuanced. Uh, I wouldn't um, recall all of them, uh, but to ex explain our thinking, we wanted to prove that, uh, you know, um, the, the stories which are potentially doesn't look like viral, uh, just mobilizing one part of the public, one part of the bubble, they can be successful. And that's what we've proven uh, and had um, Remember the, the the story we've done, you know, on the Afghan war, which was one of the most successful. Or, for instance, the story of the protest uh, of the Ukrainian miners in 1990s. But always journalistically, we're trying to find a bit of interesting angle. Like, would it be the kids of the miners uh, following, uh, going to the strike? Uh, 
when they are minors themselves today? And the answer was no. We also were trying to uh, talk to the people who had a very different views on the Soviet Union, for instance, and look at the complexity of the uh, cybernetics or IT in the 60s, where you do not have the, like black and white uh, system. There was, there was something to be proud, but of course, it was not very uh, good for the females in the Soviet cybernetics in, in 60s. And so we always try to find something different, something new, or the story on the IDPs from Chernobyl, you know, they were serious, but we wanted to have a new angle. And what we managed to uh, prove, uh, because it's always a challenge for public spirit media to prove uh, your success, uh, it's always about the clickbait today, uh, but uh, with the sociology, with the digital targeting, we managed to prove that you can measure trust, and somehow there is a potential to broaden your audience. If you get out of your bubble, and if you're trying to engage the audience, which you as the, even independent media didn't think before. So the numbers can be good, uh, not just by mobilizing your core horde, uh, but by getting the other people. So I do think that is um, that some of the findings I want to add. Uh, but I do think also that it's important to stress that this project was about a history and we really want that it would be scaled, that the filmmakers, you know, like uh, the uh, all people working in the creative industry can use it. And out of the Facebook video, that would be the series or documentaries. Uh, but it also really about the methodology and about the thinking, because uh, later when we were starting to present the, the report in Ukraine, I knew that the people who were dealing with, the, for instance, transitional justice, they were interested in like how we use the same methodology. We know that there is very difficult to, um, you know, to, to, to speak about the Donbass. You know, you try, you try, and things are not working, they're not very successful. So there is an opportunity to test it and to do something small and then scale. Uh, but also, for me, it's also very, very important that you really... Um, um, for instance, in our case, when we were working uh, still at that time at, at, at Romatske, but later we were we are working on the other project now, uh, that you can bring this thinking into the new, your newsroom, your company, when you have the people like editors, uh, cameramen, journalists, in fact, being very thoughtful that you can do the stories differently. And, you know, the evidence is there that it may work. So with that, I would probably pass the word to Ambassador Herbst and, and Herbhan, and we'll be glad to answer the questions. Natalia, thank you very much. Um, this is an ingenious and a potentially very important project. But Peter, I'd like to start with a question for you. Uh, you engage two groups of people, right, in the West and the center on the one hand, in the east and the south on the other, um, on somewhat sensitive topic. Uh, you, everyone in this on this panel kind of is either a Westerner or someone who's looking to the West as their orientation. Uh, when you reached out to people in the south and the east who live more in the area where Russian disinformation is, is prevalent, did you find any suspicion? Was it hard to engage them? Were they, were they able to open up? Unmute yourself, please. Sorry. Um, well, we worked with with a with um, a sociological institute, one of the sort of major ones in Ukraine. Um, so they wouldn't be engaging with us directly. Um, they and you know, I I suppose that there is an issue. Maybe Yevhen can talk more about this. A bit like we had shy Trump voters in 2016 who didn't want to tell pollsters about their true feelings. Is there some of that in in Ukraine now? How are sociologists and other analysts thinking about that? For our purposes, I mean, look, um, there's two ways I think that um, we, we we think about this. A, we're repeating things over and over. You know, we're, uh, we've got the polling at the start, a big all national poll. Then we have focus groups where we have many focus groups repeating the same questions. So we're looking for repetition. And then we have for every film, we did another mini poll. Yeah. So that's, you know, you're looking for stuff that averages out. You know, you're looking for overall trends. So even if somebody is shy, um then then hopefully that'll kind of get massaged out in the in the overall arc and um, actually we're not talking about things which are particularly uh sensitive i mean it's you know ukraine is a country where openly seditious parties are in parliament and some of them very very close to 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 the leadership um this is it's a huge problem in russia you know russian sociologists will say it's so hard it's almost impossible in china doing real sociology um you ask you know you do your best you ask a lot of proxy questions 
Um, whether people, maybe some people in the segment in Kharkiv and Odessa, Kramatorsk, whether some of them are even more pro-Russian than they let on, that maybe, maybe. But we're not focused on that. We were focused on historical experiences. People were very open in their negative feelings towards the Orange Revolution. People were, you know, very open in their criticism of the kind of decommunization law and all the culture war issues. So, you know, for our purposes, we, we could see that people were being pretty open and pretty, um, pretty, you know, pretty aggressive in a lot of their, in a lot of their uh, thinking, whether they are even more so underneath that. Um, you know, you try to ask proxy questions. You try to ask questions around that, that give you uh, a fairer sense. I mean, where do you see Ukraine in the future? Do you see it as independent, which is almost a proxy for with Russia? Or do you see it as integrated into Western institutions and stuff like that? That's, a, that's I think that's quite a good proxy question sometimes, but maybe Yefen can tell you more because he, he had to deal with this at the, at the cold face. Okay, uh, Yefen, if you want to address that, why don't you add your thoughts now? Well, I think this report actually nails it. Uh, I uh, have... Uh, uh, hardly had so much satisfaction reading a report that uh, comes out somewhere in the West underlying the specifics of um, the um, uh, policy of census, as I would call it, um, and that actually shows the distinctions and the differences where they actually, in my opinion, are. Uh, I think it's crucial that we see that whatever comes next is more unifying than whatever happened. I think it's crucial that we are talking about trauma because trauma is a very defining reason why Ukrainians are acting the way they are. So in that sense, I think this is a brilliant report and I really like seeing it uh, uh, coming out now. I wish we um, could uh, uh, do more to disseminate it and to make uh, the uh, international expertise uh, understand the Ukraine in, in, a better new, in, in a more nuanced way. Okay, thank you. Uh, Peter, you want to jump in? Very quickly before I forget, um, actually Yevhen's work, um, not, not that I want to make this into a love-in, but Yevhen's previous work about, which really looked at um, how the sort of, I don't know, the emotional archetype that unites all Ukrainians is surviving, you know, the bloodlands, to quote Tim Snyder, and this horrific, you know, traumatic history. And everyone's experienced some version of that, whether that's in the West or the East or in the center. Um, and that common survival of trauma. And then also what we found a common, it's not just a negative experience, a common resilience, a common, you know, self-regard for being adaptive for survivability in these extreme circumstances. And what I would call a very Ukrainian version of prioritizing security, not the Russian version where you look to the Tsar to protect you, a very Ukrainian one where you look after, you know, those immediately around you was something that we found repeating over and over in all our questions and in the stories. Um, and that after Yevhen's work actually seemed to indicate that as well. And, and it was very nice to see how our research did coalesce with what other people are thinking, too. That's almost kind of the, the universal meme throughout emotional meme of Ukraine. I think it's important that we stress the um, uh, issue of human security. We're not only talking about national security, as, uh, for instance, we would see in many cases in, that many uh, uh, autocratic regimes make. But in this case, we're talking about human security. We're talking about protection of a human being not only against external threats, but also against domestic threats, like uh, the quality of institutions, the uh, quality of decision making, the the um, uh, threats that are uh, the uh, uh, legacy of the totalitarian regime. And I think uh, this report uh, is actually looking into this um, uh, with very good dis distinction. So uh, I would like to say that uh, it's really important that we underline this um, or highlight this um, uh, trauma factor from the uh, totalitarian legacy of the Soviet Union. Once we're out of it, we can actually see a different Ukraine. We can actually see a Ukraine that can be reintroduced to the world. I think it's going to be much different than what we see from the uh, post-Soviet Russian narratives. Yeah, but thank you very much.
Um, and you've written an extraordinary book about the Holodomor. As Peter reminded me yesterday, um, understanding the Holodomor as a tragedy inflicted on Ukraine by Stalin is understood throughout the country, not just in the West and the center, but also almost as much in the East. Do you see that is, I think, cause for optimism? Do you see this as a reason to be optimistic about your project? Uh, on yes, thank you. For, yeah, I'm, I think I'm unmuted. Yes, thank you. Um, th thanks for that question. Yes, I mean, one of the fascinating um, elements of the history of the Holodomor, and this is in my book, is the way in which knowledge of it and understanding of it um, was, first of all, maintained during the, during the Soviet Union, even though it was a forbidden subject, um, and the way in which it was then, um, after, after 1990, the way it then slowly became part of the national consciousness through celebrations, through history, through presidential speeches, I think even through argument over it, um, even, even as it became a, a somewhat controversial topic. I mean, that, that helped people become interested in it. And, and it is today one of the issues that does unite Ukrainians, surprisingly. I think Peter can give you the, if he's got the numbers in front of him. I mean, one of the things that our research showed was that um, you know, across various different kinds of populations, east, west, north, south, um, urban, rural, there are, you know, most Ukrainians agree now on what happened during the Holodomor and, and, and why. Um, and that to me is a very positive story about how perceptions of history can change um, and about how they can build unity. So in a way, you know, this project is looking to build a little bit on, on what the Ukrainian historians and, and politicians and, and sort of cultural leaders have done over the last couple of decades. Um, I think that we also concluded though that the Holodomor was a, you know, it was an event in the 1930s. Um, and a lot has happened since then, including a lot of stuff that's happened in, in our own lifetimes. Um, and we felt that it's really important to find also issues and also subjects um, that are in people's personal memories that can also bring them together and, and can also be discussed in, in, in a positive way. Um, and, you know, simply focusing on the 30s and the 40s and on these issues of the very distant past um, mean that Ukrainians, you know, if, if that's all, the, if that's all that the sort of, you know, people who make history documentaries, if that's all that they want to do, then they will miss out on a lot of subjects that people care about, maybe feel traumatized about, um, don't know a lot about, would like to know more about. They miss out on a lot of subjects that are more recent and, and part of recent history, which also help to shape current events. And so, you know, even as a historian of the Holodomor, I mean, I wrote a whole book on it. Um, I do think that it's it's valuable to look at that as an example of how to change views of history and how to how to create an accepted national narrative, but also as a as a basis for looking for other other such subjects, um, you know, that that have a that have more recent echoes and, and meaning to people. Okay. Uh, John, uh, I probably want to add something also uh, following up uh, both Anne and Yevhen, because it was interesting also, you know, how the uh, segments, how our audience was split uh, in their attitude to the Soviet Union. It, not, it wasn't exactly like the negative or positive. It was about that part of the people felt that they gained something after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the others felt that they had lost something. What we managed to, um, to, to see, because not all our films were about 90s, we moved a bit, like we started to do the stories also about like peasant uprising against uh, before the Holodomor or things happening in 60s. Uh, but we found out that it's very, very interesting that we can engage people and the people who in the end are more, let's say, they, they do not like when they are impose the idea that Soviet Union is bad. But if you ask them that, like, do you agree in the case that the rights of the soldiers during the Afghan war were violated? And they say, yes, it is. And do you want that the rights of the soldiers would be preserved? And they say, yes. At the same time, also, we manage the people who were, for instance, like, uh, very anti-Soviet. Uh, and probably our task is not to we never had a task to impose any version of history. Our task was always like to let the people hear 
the others. So we try to make the stories about the 60s, about the dissidents, and also say that those dissidents also were, you know, drawing Soviet mosaics. And then the people who very were very negative uh, towards the Soviet Union, they were able to trust that video, and they, the video was successful. So I do think that what also for me is very interesting, especially in the modern world, people always say you should be very blunt, you should be very simple. No, people are ready for complex issues if they are properly, uh, you know, uh, in a nice artistic way. But if they are made complex, the people are ready to accept that. They, in fact, Ukrainians like that. Natalia, what you just said um, prompts another question. Uh, even people in the in the East and the South uh, presumably did or did not like Soviet treatment of dissidents. Did that come up in your conversation? Oh, uh, we in fact thought felt that the people were less interested in the let's say um, dissidents in a way when they were speaking about the identity. So, for instance, we've done the video, which is very, very un, un you, you know very not uh, told story about the uprising of the people during the Soviet times in Kriviri and Odessa against police brutality in the Soviet times. Okay. So, in fact. I think we can, for the people who do not, who associate the dissidents with probably some kind of uh, very, let's say, nationalist ag agenda, I'm speaking about the people who are kind of uh, supporting Soviet Union. Right. There is a way to tell a different story if we're speaking about the other rights, security, for instance. And in all the polls, uh, though we made a stories about the rights of the Crimean Tatars, uh, home return of the Crimean Tatars, it was very clear that uh, the uh, abuse of the citizens' rights were the most, uh, you know, supported by both segments, by both audiences. Okay, that, that's very helpful. I have one more question for you. Have you presented the report to Ukrainian authorities and their reaction? And what are the prospects for implementation of the recommendations? Uh, so we, we had uh, exactly this same time a week ago, uh, the presentation for the uh, Minister of Culture. Uh, and he sounded very engaged. And uh, and I also wanted to say that for us, it's very important that we do not want to impose anything and we do not want it used in a way that we that something is imposed. And it's not about like just one message about the Ukrainian unity, which people don't understand what is it. Um, so we would present these stories for the uh, you know cultural institutions. Um, uh, it's just the beginning. It had been just translated into the Ukrainian, so we just moving uh, in a, in this direction. Uh, we also with uh, Peter uh, are, are prolonging one project because we managed to gather support for producing the uh, ten documentaries about the new history of Ukraine for the Ukrainian public broadcaster. Uh, that would be not the huge project, but quite a big project. I mean, like this is not about the series or uh, fiction films, but the documentaries. So I do think that uh, we are moving and we do hear the interest of the people from different fields, whether we can, um, you know, use the same at least like technique or method for, 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 for them. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have we have um, already a number of questions from the audience, so I will I will turn to some of these questions. Uh, the first one is, um, how about the generational dimension? How is polarization affecting youth versus older generations? Um, Peter mentioned that you you were, you were quote, uh, quoting to me approaching people between eighteen and fifty, but may, I don't know if you have a sense for the differences in age and their response to these questions. So so. Um, I mean, there are some stuff, I mean, there's some obvious stuff that you would expect around sort of uh, nostalgia. So even people in the East who are younger have, have less nostalgia for the Soviet Union as opposed to much older people, which um, you would expect. Um, but it's really, it, it's funny too, Ukraine, um, there's different ways of looking at, you know, the polarization in Ukraine. There's the, look, I'm very careful using these geographic distinctions. They're floating, they're moving around. I'm using them now as a shorthand, but there's the sort of, um, the classic East versus West thing, which is much, much more confusing than that. I really don't like using this binary, but, but that does, it does, you know, in a very fudgy way, it does talk about uh, issues around culture war and stuff like that. But there's, at the same time, there's a classic um, town versus country one. So if you look at the social values of people in Kharkiv and let's say Lviv, they're very similar. They stand on different sides of the culture war, which is a 
a theme that's in the, so pushed by Russian propaganda, but their social values are very, 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 sim uh, very, very, very similar. That you know, liberal leaning, pro democracy. But then you have two blocks in, in the countryside who stand on very different sides of the culture war. So some are in the south and east, simply pro Russian. You know, the older pensioners in 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 the villages of the Donbas, and obviously the ones in Western Ukraine are very, very patriotic, very, very against Russia. But actually their social values are quite similar. They both kind of skew a little bit conservative and authoritarian. Um, so actually Ukraine, if it wasn't sort of besieged by this, by, by the war and many other factors, um, you'd probably have like, you know, a city versus countryside sort of polarization, like you do in, in so much of Europe. Uh, so so it's a funny place, the Ukraine is, is, is um, you know, you can cut it in different ways. What was very interesting, though, talking about polarization in the last elections, we weren't researching the elections as such, the last presidential ones. But one of the questions we asked was about, and it's a very important one for us when you think about history, do you feel your life has improved over your lifetime? And the correlation was that people who felt their life had improved over their lifetime voted Poroshenko. People who felt their life had got worse on either side of the cultural war divide voted Zelensky. So in that sense, Zelensky was the classic populist left behind vote. Um, again, we didn't set out to, re to, to, to research that, that just kind of fell in our lap. Um, and that sense of being left behind, that completely includes people in the cities and in the countryside or on different sides of the culture war. And it'd be very interesting to explore that deeper. That just wasn't our mission. But um, that's another way of thinking about the polarization, the sense of, the sense of feeling you've lost out in some way. Okay, thank you. We have another question, which I think is directed towards Natalia. How did you measure the impact of your videos apart from the number of people who watched them? What change in people and their relationships as a result? Natalia? I want, I want Peter to uh, join me in, in answering that because Please. it was used, uh, the, we worked with the firm in, in London. So in fact, apart from, uh, you know, targeting the uh, videos to the very particular audiences uh, among the segments. We looked at the trust alignment. So the most successful, were the, so for, for us, success was to have, first of all, the most watched video among the both audience, but also those where both segments are trusting the most. Uh, Peter, will you, uh, will you explain it? Because it's very in the core of the, of the report. Yeah, so trust was the main thing that we were looking at. Ukrainians in general have very low trust towards media. Our people in sort of the Central East are deep, deeply, 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 deeply cynical. Um, so what was great seeing both uh, trusting our videos, we, kept, we, we compared them to content from other Ukrainian TV channels and the trust levels were much higher. But as Natalia said, we wanted to align trust levels. We wanted to see what do they trust equally. It's not hard getting you know, doing a very partisan video that one side trusts and the other one doesn't, which we did see in some cases, it's very hard getting both to trust. And we did, we had around eight different factors of trust that we looked at, all the way from bias, fairness, accuracy, and then negative characteristics as well. It was a scale that our colleagues at the Media and Communications Department of the LSE came up with. And then we had a bunch of questions that we were repeating um, around different videos. That was our main. Um, that was our main uh, uh, indicator for this for this project. That balance of films that are watched equally and films that are trusted. Uh, moving forward, um, I would love to bring in a lot more factors, and I'd love to actually have a, a serious discussion in the kind of like media effects and uh, kind of you know uh, community about what do we think are the positive effects that we're looking for if we're trying to build this contemporary Ukrainian agora. I think well, I'd love to look at things like increase in civic mindedness, uh, increases in empathy, uh, decreases in hatred and, uh, uh, and prejudice. I mean, I think it would be fantastic for us to really go much deeper on the methodology side and, and ask those questions. Um, but this was a first step um, and a, I think an important one, but you know, I think we all, I mean, the great sea change that has to happen, if we're going to, for public service spirited media, the media that cares about civic engagement, which isn't a lot of media, let's be honest, most media wants to play up polarization, which is the great tragedy of our world. But for those that do, thinking about what exactly we're trying to achieve is really, really important. Okay. Uh, Peter, your remarks also call to mind another question from me. 
uh, for any of you. Uh, your project, I mean, as Peter just mentioned, the big media in Ukraine is a problem or a problem. Uh, how effective can your proposals be, your recommendations be, without somehow drawing them into this? Or can, or can you draw them into it? Peter, take a shot. Anyone else, someone else may want to add to you? Uh, let, let, me, let me step in if I can. Um, yeah. I'm a member of the supervisory board of the Public Service Broadcast in Ukraine, and um, this is something that I'm uh, trying to follow. And one of the things that we see uh, in the Ukrainian market is that uh, the players that are playing um, with, uh, with um, agendas in good faith are mixed with the players that are actually doing their propaganda part. And what this report exactly shows is uh, what are the sore points of where uh, the propaganda can be successful. And uh, if you compare um, the agenda that is set by uh, some of the Ukrainian television stations, you can actually see that they're working uh, just to produce greater divide. If you're uh, uh, looking at those players that are um, trying to, to, to unify or trying to heal or trying to, to present different uh, uh, points of view, different agendas, you see that these are mostly uh, new or independent players. So um, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, situation in, in media environment is actually a situation where we have pluralism, but we don't have much freedom. And uh, uh, if we're talking about private players, a lot of private players are actually the ones that are part of the problem, not part of the solution. Do that. Anyone else want to jump in on this? If not, we have other questions. Uh, here's one. How much and how quickly has Ukraine's educational system adapted to teaching inclusive history and updated its curriculum in the directions that you feel are important? I can jump in here as well, as, if you allow me. Um, uh, as we know, Ukraine is a uh, country of uh, rather weak institutions. So one of the things that, that happens is there are some changes that are happening with introduction and improved versions of school cur curriculum. And that's uh, part of the change, part of the transformation that we see on the institutional level. But then at the same time, we have uh, the good question is how tightly the teachers, for instance, are following these changes. Are the teachers complying with the regulations of the ministry? And what we see very often is that in different schools throughout Ukraine, you will see very different discourses, for instance, with regard to history that is being taught to the kids. Um, and it will take time uh, for the uh, narratives to become more unified. Uh, it's, it's, it's a moving target. It's happening, but it's happening very slowly. Okay. Um, anyone else want to jump in on this? Natalia? No, um, I, I just say that, yes, there are, the, I in fact was once digging into the school books and the recent school books, how, for instance, the recent events of the, uh, you know, uh, the sec of the uh, Russian-Ukrainian war or the revolution of dignity is uh, written in the books. So, in fact, we just got the really the book on that just last year before there was not much in the school books uh, but i would uh, support what yevhan said it's a lot about how the teachers uh, are explaining the events it's not just about the textbooks so what is existing in the public sphere is critical so really uh especially if we're speaking about the recent history uh, i mean teachers are watching the media uh, so there is a huge impact of the media to the teachers on teaching the, 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 the modern history. So I do think, um, you know, what we are doing is just one of the part. And you earlier asked how to, you know, be successful. It's, it's, it's a joint work of, you know, journalists, uh, filmmakers, people. Uh, in fact, I also, you no, know, I don't mind. I want if the oligarchic channel embrace our report and do something good with that, Sure, we don't mind. You know, you know, we don't want it be misused, of course, and and I think it it it, it can be. Uh, we design it in that way, but yeah, we 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 we, um, we we are happy to share, and we do want that. You know, the, the the more institutions, you know, do not spend money in way in producing the content which would won't be helpful 
or for instance maybe it won't uh, be successful and uh, it won't work um, so uh, that's what we also uh, explaining that we can test something we already proven that something is working let's find way more things which are working and uh, use them and uh, and just shortly mentioned that uh, I, I worked with a quite a young team and I mean I'm in the project of the production of these stories for a year and I'm really fascinating how the people who were born in their nine in, in 90s or end of 80s how they are becoming engaged by these topics I would never think that you know Afghan war would they would care or 90s and I do think that they feel like oh I never talked with my mother about that I never talked with my, my father about that so I see the huge potential of the young people uh, what is not history for us it's already something they don't know so I do think there are it, it's treasure for us as a journalist to to see that there is so much else to speak about without uh, you know stopping to speak about the second world war or other problematic issues thank you uh, we have a very wide-ranging question, picking up on, on I think, with the remarks that Anne made. Um, it is. It would be interesting to hear from the participants about how Ukraine polarization is different from political polarization that is very prominent now in the United States, or perhaps also compare with polarization over Franco in Spain. Anne, you want to take a shot at this? Almost a metaphysical question. Can sure. I again? It's a, it's a, up to Anne. Yeah. No, no, and, all right, I'll, I'll say something first. Um, I, I, you know, it's a metaphysical question, but it's also, there's a very easy answer, and the answer is no, it isn't different. Um, you know, no, the issues are different, the techniques can be different, but, you know, the, the, the use of wedge issues or organized, um, you know, hatred of minorities or um, religious divides, you know, you know, using these kinds of tactics to divide societies um, and thereby, um, you know, and thereby rule them is about as old as humanity. I mean, this is a, this is a, you know, you can find instances of polarization going. I mean, you know, what were the religious wars in Europe, you know, in the in the early modern period, except you know, evidence of polarization. You know, Catholics and Protestants fought each other. Um, so in that very, very broad sense, you know, no, they're not, it's not different. Um, um, uh, you know, I mean, there are special circumstances in Ukraine and some of the, one of the special circumstances is the very strong presence of Russian disinformation um, and the impact that it's had through Russian television, which a lot of Ukrainians watch. Um, and I think it's really, in a way, thanks to the Russians that the Second World War has become this um, almost undiscussable issue with, um, you know, which there's so much anger about it because it's, that's one of the issues that has been very important for Putin. And so he's, he's pushed his interpretation of the Second World War. He's called um, the Ukrainian, you know, national movement, you know, everybody from Poroshenko to Natalia, he's called them fascists. You know, he's used that Second World War language um, as, a, as a way of polarizing. You know, we don't, we don't have that particular version of it in the United States, you know, we don't have it in Poland exactly in that way. We don't have it in Spain, but no, I don't think I don't think it's very different, and I don't think the solutions necessarily are. I mean, and I mean again, the subjects and issues will be different, but I don't think the solutions are kind of psychologically different either. I mean, finding, you know, changing the subject, finding different things to talk about, um, unifying people around different issues you know, changing the political coalitions so that they're more productive um, and less polarized. I mean, this is the way you solve these kinds of problems in every country. Um, you know, if you look at what Spain did after Franco, this was more or less it. I mean, they they agreed not to talk about Franco for a long time. Um, and that was a little weird and it, you know, it had ups and downs and there are people who didn't like the way that was done. But one of the effects of it was that they talked about other things like how do we increase Spanish prosperity? And that was a subject that kept them going and, and kept the center right and the center left, not knifing one another in the back for a long time. So, so there are, you know, there is evidence for, um, you know, ways in which this can be done in other countries. And, and I don't think, I don't think they're, they're kind of dramatically, you know, deep cultural or biological differences between nations. No. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, I wanted to add, like, I was, I'm preparing myself to travel to the U.S. elections now, and I was covering the previous elections. And of course, when I went there in 2016 into the U.S., I've seen that, like, I've seen something in the Donbas. I've seen something during the revolution, during the, you know, Russian-Ukrainian war in Crimea, uh, the polarization of the society. I was like little by little shocked by, you know, how different are the pictures of the. Fox News and CNN, and uh, you know, it's just like parallel reality, which reminded me so much about the Ukrainian television. So I do think now we a bit in the same boat. Of course, Ukraine is still, you know, um, not that advanced democracy, but there are way more similarities than we, we can expect. Thank you. Uh, here's another question. Do you have the the questioner notes the value of your of your research? And ask you have any plans for dialogue with peace building practitioners, because they, they see your research as being useful to peace builders in Ukraine. Tal, you want to take a look a shot at that? You're muted. Um, right. There you go. I saw that, Peter. Yeah, we in fact had presented uh, the report and we were approached uh, to, to do this by the group which is working on the concept of the on the transitional justice. These are the lawyers, hum, human rights lawyers who are working on the uh, what we can do with the uh, uh, you know, uh, concept of the transitional justice uh, in, in um, regarding the, the, the conflict in, in the Donbas and in Crimea. I think it was just the very beginning, but I mean, if we can be helpful, we probably would face it like the methodology can be used. Okay, we have a question. Uh, the question refers to the July 16th initiative for a common future, a Ukrainian initiative, which I I'm not familiar with. He says they are partly funded by the Hans Seidel Foundation, a branch of the German Christian Social Union. And his question is, do any of the panelists think it would be worthwhile to engage with this group? Um, I have looked up uh, um, the, just Googled the initiative because I wasn't familiar with it. And it has uh, 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 many uh, famous names there. Some of the names are known uh, for um, uh, providing some controversial uh, positions on um, uh, where Ukraine should go that are rather in line with uh, 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 the Russian uh, narrative. Um, uh, Ukraine is a free and a pluralistic society, so these experts also exist and they uh, practice, they, they have, you know, their views expressed freely. So um, this is probably one of the fruits of democracy that we have. Okay. Um, I, think, I think the implications are clear. Uh, all right. Uh, are there any plans for follow on research by your group, um, Peter? Um, so, we, I mean, we, 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 lots, hopefully. Um, so, as Natalia said, um, I think she put it very modestly. Uh, we already had the, um, uh, the next wave of, of work. So, the uh, 10 films are going to be made based on this methodology, based on our results um, with uh, the public broadcaster. I really want to um, use those ten films because those films have money for some social research, like eight focus groups or something. Um, I really want to build some more uh, methodology about how we measure impact. So that's the obvious next step. We're talking to other donors a lot. Donors get this. I mean, they you know they they seem to understand us very well, and we're talking a lot about future projects. But listen, the real scalability will come when the philosophy that we're that we're trying to advocate for becomes you know centralized within editing rooms for example if the public broadcaster can grow um and it's a philosophy so it's, it's a world view it's a world view that was very similar to lord reese who created the bbc i'm currently rereading his autobiography he he was facing very similar things dictators taking over radio in the 1920s and 30s and a polarized partisan tabloid landscape in Great Britain. And he was thinking about how do I create what he called like, you know, the city state of old, you know, the Agora, um, in order to plug our new institute um, um, at the start of the 20th century. So we need this kind of thinking really kind of right at the center of the Ministry of Culture, the public broadcaster. And yes, of course, the commercial, I'm saying in Ukraine, commercial broadcasters as well, because they're not really commercial. Um, 
that's the main aim. And and of course, the real, t you know, the, 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 the real aim is scalability and, and getting it there. But the noises that we hear from these people are the right noises. The things that the culture minister is saying are the right things. So there is, you know, Ukraine is a country at war. People understand the need for unity because it's existential. So that makes me very optimistic. Oh, I'd have to say that, that I share your optimism. I've, I've been watching Ukraine closely for the last 30 years, and we've seen a consolidating national identity, um, not least because of Mr. Putin's aggressive designs. Uh, but not to be too Pollyannish, uh, and there's a question for the panel to end on, what, what do you think are the principal obstacles to the consolidation of that national identity and a common understanding of history and the major challenges to the country in the months and years ahead? Um, let me try and, 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 and get that one. Uh, I think uh, security is the key factor. Uh, if Ukraine should have the security it needs, I think everything else can be dealt with. I think there will be enough um, uh, feeling of uh, protectedness that would allow to have a very candid discussion inside the society on the touchy subjects. But security is not really available, both in national security and in human security terms. And that causes every side to play zero sum game. And that's exactly the problem. Okay, thank you. And I know you've got another event very soon. If you want to jump in here, so then you can uh, depart, I understand. Anne has thank departed. You. I mean, I uh, yeah, 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 sorry. No, I'm here. I, I would say, I would say, um, I, I would echo what Yevhen just said. Um, I mean, if nobody interferes with Ukraine, if there isn't another invasion, if Putin doesn't once again identify a war in Ukraine as something that will be useful to him, um, and if nobody else does that either, um, then I think the prospects for um, reunification and and you know the recreation of a, of a of a very stable state, all the kind of bare bones of it are are in place. I mean, the really difficult question over the next um, several years, um, particularly if there is a ceasefire in the Donbass, will be how to integrate that region. Um, and Natalia hinted at this already, and I saw there were one or two questions about it. Um, you know, and that is that is something that requires a lot of thought. You know, because that's a that's a region where not only is it penetrated by Russian propaganda, not only has it been ruled by these strange quasi states for the last few years, but it's also, um, you know, people there are very bitter about the war. And if if that can be bridged, maybe using tactics and techniques like this one, um, then then I think I you know that then I, I can see a great future for Ukraine. Thank you, Natalia. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's all security. I also think that there is something uh, that's not a new idea in a way how the media are built. Uh, it's impossible not to mention the, the social media. I talked a lot to I was preparing for a talk and I talked a lot to the colleagues in Tbilisi, in uh, Chisnau or, uh, or elsewhere. I've been coming from Belarus. I know how is it it's now to you know have the people in their bubbles and i mean my editor uh, colleagues who are working in the caucasus for instance they say that they've never felt uh, how alienated are the audiences uh, so i do think it's also something how we should strengthen the independent media and as a platforms uh, how we find out the the how we really also build the public spirit media uh, not in the just radio and television how in the digital way we find the ways to create, you know, public broadcasters for uh, 21st century, uh, which tries to get out of the bubbles. That's another issue, because if we don't do anything, the people would stay where they are now. Thank you. Peter, the last word is yours. When we were doing the focus groups with these different segments, we were working with a colleague of mine, uh, Sophia Gaston, who's one of the great experts on nostalgia. She's written incredible research about nostalgia and how prevalent it has become in, um, in, uh, in Western Europe and in, in America. And what she found in our focus groups was that actually Ukrainians, even though they've gone through these horrific tra traumas, even though many 
don't necessarily have purely positive uh, experiences of, of, of the last decades. They all think that A, they can influence the political change in the country. After Maidan, after the war, after, let's be open, the, the uh, election of Zelensky, people feel empowered in a way they don't in Western Europe, where everyone's like, nothing changes. People feel empowered and people feel their children will live better than them. So they're actually optimistic. So empowered and optimistic with a ground level belief in kind of your power as a democratic citizen, which is something we've lost. And I remember walking out of this very cramped room, I think it was in Odessa at the time, uh, you know, and she was like, this is amazing. This is such a positive country. I've never seen this in Western Europe. And it's worth hearing it from her because it's so easy to get cynical and tired about the slowness of reforms. But the overall trajectory is actually very, very powerful. And in some ways, in very Ukrainian nuanced ways, very positive. Are you saying that Ukrainians are having Euro fatigue? What was that? <laughs> are you saying Ukrainians are having Euro fatigue? Euro, Euro. Euro fatigue, Euro. a little bit of irony. Okay. Peter, thank you very much. This is a, a very interesting project. Congratulations to you and everyone on it. And thank you, Natalia and Yevhen. And we thank, thank you in absentia to Anne. And thank you all for tuning in. And we thank SIPA for joining us in making this project. Thank you, thank you. If anybody wants to get in touch, email us um, at Hopkins or at LSE. Our emails are easily available on the websites. Okay, great. Okay. Bye. Yeah, bye.